one of the other ways that Boris has been trying to save his leadership is by this so-called policy of Operation Red Meat, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, which is who came up with that? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a terrible week for like cringy coinages. Well. Exactly. Operation Red Meat, Operation Big Dog. <laughs> Big Dog's got yeah. Yeah. The, uh, Dog. What was it? The Pork Pie Putsch. The pork Pie Putsch, Did you yeah. get a sense of how this, this government and the media class in particular are just so cringe, really? Put, put all the journalists on lockdown, talk. that's what I want to do. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Furlough them for a period. One of, the, one of the, key, the key things we should talk about is um, Nadine Doris, the culture secretary, said that she's going to freeze the BBC licence fee for two years and hinted that she might scrap it entirely. Now, it seems as if Every couple of years, there's a row between the Tory government and the BBC. Yeah. And the reaction, you know, whenever they say they're going to make some change to the way the BBC operates, people act as if, you know, civilization itself is <laughs> oh, about to are, end. Yeah, people have gone mad, haven't they? They're yeah. so upset about this. And, the, you know, well, I look, I say this, I gauge this through Twitter, um, which is probably <laughs> yeah. not the best way, but... That's where these people hang out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. where all the lovies are. Yeah. And, it, and it is some sort of major co- uh, figures in the commentary are putting out stuff about all the great things the BBC do. And they, this is very much a politically partisan debate now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, that was it, uh, the list that came out of all the great comedies the BBC has produced, none of which appeared in the last 20 years. <laughs> so these kind of things actually are self-defeating when mm. you make these points, because of course, you know, you know, there's quite obviously a problem with the BBC, but also I don't, you know, sure, poll after poll over many years now has shown that the, the majority of the public recognise that the licence is uh, is outdated. It's not, yeah. it's not there to stay. It doesn't really make sense in the modern era. Mm. Um, and a lot of people don't want to be paying for a service that they don't use. And that's, you know, perfectly reasonable. And people are proposing ideas of... Um, a subscription service. We were talking this, about this on GB News the other day because I read an article in The Guardian which was talking about this this idea of a subscription model as being something that is promulgated by the hard right. <laughs> this is what the hard right are interested. How can you politicise <laughs> things to that extent yeah. <laughs> where, where you think that this is a, it's just people who don't want to pay for a, sh- a channel they don't watch. They're not calling for a white ethno state. It's so, it's so weird that The Guardian and people like that interpret it in this polarizing way. I Does that make Netflix a fascist platform? Apparently. Well, yeah. they do have Dave Chappelle. So That's it'll, true. It'll, oh, it'll, yeah. it'll all the dots connect now. Yeah. But no, it is, but it's interesting because the argument has now become, it's like BBC is one of those institutions which is between us and barbarism almost. Yeah. <laughs> like it's yeah. just yeah. become part of this very crude sort of culture. Well, I think the point you make about um, the self-defeating argument is, is so true. I mean, Adil Ray... It's now on, on GMB, but obviously done a lot of work with BBC over the years. Um, when he put out that um, promotional video that the BBC put out a few decades ago. John Cleese one. The John Cleese one. So it's John Cleese is this kind of pub bore almost, kind of arguing the toss as to why the licence yeah. fees are a load of bollocks. And then these various <laughs> BBC luminaries appear and say, well, they do do great documentaries. And it's David Attenborough, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Dimbleby pops up and talks about the politics coverage. And all that served as, as a reminder First of all, the BBC has always been a bit hectoring on the question of licence <laughs> yeah. fees, but also that it used to be such a much more heavyweight yeah, institution yeah, yeah, absolutely. than it than it is today, and it's just very difficult to to make the same kind of argument for it because I think the the thing is that the, if the BBC is to exist, then it, it's not necessarily just to go and let it compete. You've got to be able to make an argument as to why this is so important that it needs to almost exist, not subject to the pressures of the market and yeah. all the rest of it, which is fair. But then you think, what is the case that they're trying to make for it, and especially given the fact that we've got a public service broadcaster, which by any estimation uh, seems to really dislike the public. And yeah. I think this discussion has really showed that up to a certain extent. How do you do that? Yeah. You know, this that, is difficult. Gareth Roberts, didn't he write a piece mm. for Spike this week about yeah. this? And this idea that the the hectoring nature of the BBC and the way in which they seem to hate working class people, let's put it like that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, or there's, you know, the... the this whole polarization of left and right is misleading. It's nothing to do with that. It's mm. to do with this identitarian movement, whatever we want to call it, critical social justice, which has infected the BBC to such an extent that you can't watch a program without feeling like you're being lectured yeah. on your morality. And I know the original Rethian principles had to educate as mm-hmm. one of the principles, uh, what was it, inform, educate, entertain. Mm-hmm. Um, but they've really pushed the educate yeah, to extreme. Re-educate. Re-educate. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Educate yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, this new slogan. And it's um, it's not their business yeah. uh, to tell you what to think about or to assume that your audience base is all homophobe mm. and racist. You know, this is just bizarre. Absolutely. Now, something has happened slightly tangentially to the BBC that we should talk about a, a little bit about. The, the statue a statue by the sculptor Eric Gill has mm. been vandalised. And you, Andrew, predicted that this would happen. I am a prophet. You are, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, yeah. The wake of prophet the, of the in the wake of the original wars, statue wars in that Black Lives Matter summer in 2020. That's right. I mean, it wasn't difficult to predict. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> I'd love to take the credit, but yeah. yeah. Well, the so the Eric Gill statue is a statue of Ariel and Prosper outside of the BBC Broadcasting House. Uh, mm. Those are obviously characters from The Tempest, from Shakespeare's play. Um, and um, it was 
sculpted by Eric Gill, who we found out after his death. You know, someone wrote a biography in the 80s and this biographer had access to his diaries. And in his mm. diaries, he admitted to molesting his daughters and the family dog. Uh, so not a nice man, not yeah. a pleasant man. No one was claiming that he was. Mm. Um, and so someone has climbed up this ladder uh, with a hammer mm. uh, to attack and was up there for hours. And the police were standing there just sort of watching, not really doing anything about this. And of course, um, this is, came a week after the Colston 4 uh, verdict. And yeah. you do, you know, you do think, are you joining the dots there? Because, you know, is there a sense in which the state is now legitimizing the attack or vandalism of monuments that you just don't happen to like? Yeah. It's always going to be a subjective judgment. I've been having all these arguments with people online about this because, again, inevitably it comes back to, yeah, but he was a paedophile, he was a sexual monster, mm. but I'm not denying any of that or saying that his crimes aren't abhorrent. What I'm saying is that statue didn't molest anyone. Yeah. The statue is a work of art and has absolutely nothing to do with him. I believe that. I really can mm. separate the art from the artist. I think if we don't do that, we're going to be decimating our cultural landscape. The Western canon would have to go. Mm. I think about uh, um, in Florence, if you go to the Piazza Ceneria, the main square in Florence, there's a beautiful statue of Perseus uh, by Cellini. Now, I've read Cellini's biograph autobiography. He's not a nice man, killed people, um, had sex with minors, mm. um, you know, really kind of extreme. Mm. In fact, he only wrote the biography because it was under house arrest for, for sodomy with uh, minors. So terrible man. But if that statue were to go, it would be an absolute travesty, mm. right? So we have to accept that artists sometimes are cunts, right? That's something we just have to accept. <laughs> sometimes they're not nice people mm, and yeah. you just have to deal with that, you know? Yeah. And, and, and by, if he were alive today, I'd like to see Gil on trial yeah. and prosecuted and mm. imprisoned, right? Without a doubt. Um, but I, I, I and, and maybe this is contentious, but I just don't see how the, uh, destroying that artwork mm. will in any way uh, uh, make any kind of atonement for the crimes that he committed.